It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Kitchener Centre. No? Yeah? Okay. My question is to the Minister of Education. Oh, no, wait. Um, if you're seeking unanimous consent of the House to turn to. You have to tell us. Mr. Speaker, we had already worked it out ahead of time, but I seek unanimous consent to stand down the two leads. Consent to stand down the two uh, leaders' questions from the official opposition. Agreed? Agreed. 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 I'll now recognize the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Today, we are joined by students from the Toronto Youth Cabinet and the Ontario Student Trustee Association. They are here to highlight the failure of this government and the previous Liberal government before them to meaningfully address anti-black racism and racial equity in our schools. This government's piecemeal approach to reviewing one school board only when it makes the news just won't work. It's time to stop with the Band-Aid solutions and take a coordinated action to address racism in our schools with a real pro province-wide strategy. Will the Minister of Education commit today to establishing, in consultation with members of the community, a provincial strategy to address racial inequities in our schools? Minister of Education, to reply. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member for the question. I think all members of this legislature are resolved to combat all forms of racism, discrimination, and xenophobia that exist within our schools, in our communities, and within this country. Speaker, I appreciate the youth leaders of this province, including the Toronto Youth Cabinet and the student trustees, have raised this issue. It is not a challenge that manifests in one jurisdiction. It is a provincial, perhaps national and global challenge we must combat. To answer the question, I'm very much committed to working with the member opposite and every legislator to combat it province-wide, to take steps to ensure the resources and de-escalation training is in place so that we can root out the scourge of racism that exists in every school in this province. Supplementary question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And with, uh, with all due respect, uh, the Toronto Youth Cabinet and the student trustees of this province don't need a lecture from this Minister of Education about the extent to which Order. racialization of students and, and inequity is a province-wide issue. We have heard from parents and students and teachers in, in Toronto and across the province about the urgent need to address systemic racism in the education system. You cannot do that by cutting programs meant to support racialized students, by removing teaching and support staff from classrooms, or by ignoring these student voices. Will the minister listen to those voices, commit today to reverse his cuts to education, and invest in a province-wide strategy to address racial equity and anti-black racism in our schools? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, there is a real challenge of anti-black racism taking place within our schools. I've heard this from principals, from teachers, from support staff, and of course parents and students themselves. I've consulted, but in Peel and other regions of this province, and the overwhelming consensus is that there must be action, and the government is resolved to combat it, to work with the members opposite. However, the question from the member from Davenport mentions the importance of having educators on side. And we believe diversity of candidates must be part of the ability of principals to select. If I could quote Nancy Brady, the president of the Ontario Principals Council, quote, this regulation 274 leaves, quote, no ability to hire teachers who reflect the equity and diversity Order. of the student population. So the question for the member opposite is, will you work with the government to Order. ensure that we can help improve that regulation by giving more authority to principals to hire merit-based candidates of diversity Bond. in this province? Next question, the member for Durham. My question is for the Solicitor General. Uh, it's so great to be back in the legislature, but I must say we, I really enjoyed my time back in the Durham community, uh, meeting individually with constituents and also working together with my fellow Durham Region colleagues, the member from Whitby, the President of the Treasury Board and the Minister of Finance. Uh, to really try to tackle region-wide issues. Um, and one of the things we were pleased to announce as a group was a new funding for the Durham Region Police Service, a $9.5 million grant that's really focused on combating gun and gang violence, supporting community safety, and assisting community members in crisis. Can the Solicitor General please share how this funding not only is supporting Durham Region, but the whole province? 
The Solicitor General to reply. Thank you, Speaker. Um, Please to. You know, what is most uh, exciting for these particular grants is they are community-driven community initiatives. So the police and the police services and the communities work together on what their priorities are, whether that is community safety, guns and gangs, human trafficking. And so they, they apply and they, those applications are then uh, balanced and that's why it is so uh, positive to see regions and municipal forces proactively working with their communities and focusing on what is most needed within those communities. Uh, Durham is, of course, just one example um, where we have uh, invested uh, across Ontario from Durham to Dryden, and uh, it's a pleasure to be part of those investments as an Ontario government. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the Solicitor General for highlighting the important work she's doing to keep our community safe. Now, we all know there are some types of crimes that really span across the province between many communities and municipalities, impacting law-abiding Ontarians across the province. We know that criminals often do not respect geographic or municipal boundaries. That's why it's important there's a coordinated response across the province, and it really sometimes requires provincial leadership to ensure that communities and across the province have those resources to better coordinate. Can the Solicitor General please share how Ontario's new Community Safety and Policing Grants program provides p police services like the Durham Region Police Service with tools and resources to tackle larger, complex, and province-wide issues? Question. General. And now an answer. Um, thank you, Speaker. Uh, as I said, the, um, the Community Safety and Policing Grant Program allows communities to focus in on what is most critically needed at that time, and that's what the Durham Region has done. But as the member uh, rightly highlighted, uh, the ability and need for um, police services to work collaboratively on investigations is something that I'm very excited to see and frankly we have already seen some very positive outcomes of those joint investigations that have led to uh, a lot of very positive outcomes where we were able to actually track down criminals who do not respect municipal boundaries and uh, when we start to see those joint investigations actually laying charges and getting people off the streets uh, it ultimately makes our community safer safer and, and uh, it's why this joint operation and this working together whether it is opp or neighboring uh, municipal forces working together is so critically important thank you very much the next question, the member for Kiewetanong. Good morning, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Last week, I uh, dropped by Taitanega Mohawk Territory to visit the land defenders who were standing in solidarity with the uh, Wet'suwet'en Nation. But also, they're bringing attention to the unacceptable conditions that Indigenous people are living in. No access to clean drinking water. No proper access to health or dental care no meaningful access to the job market, and 150 years of disrespect for treaty rights. Mr. Speaker, actions like this happen because the government has no real commitment to reconciliation. What actions is this government taking with Indigenous people to truly achieve reconciliation? The Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And with respect the, to the Tyendinaga uh, blockade, we moved quickly to leverage, support, and facilitate Indigenous leadership to bring a resolution to that uh, blockade, given the uncertainty of the federal government's presence and commitment uh, to that particular blockade. Subsequently, Mr. Speaker, we have had an opportunity to speak, I've had an opportunity to speak with the federal minister and urged him to uh, address uh, with the prime minister serious and profound national questions, Mr. Speaker, the scope and power of hereditary chiefs, the application of indigenous law in general, and to resource projects that were underpinning uh, this blockade and inspiring other more dangerous blockades that we had seen arise across this province and across the country. Mr. Speaker, I can report that as recently as 
Uh, Sunday evening, the Premier and I spoke to the Prime Minister and urged him to take a coordinated leadership role Spons. so that we could bring these blockades to an end. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A supplementary question. Back to the, back to the Premier. I hear you, but Ontario's actions do not mean a lot to people with no clean drinking water, yes, that's to right. youth with suicidal thoughts, to those who don't have the mental health supports they need in their communities, to the youth that have already had died by suicide. Mr. Speaker, the natural resources that live in our treaty territories will not be developed until these issues are reconciled. Reconciliation with the Indigenous people in this government isn't working. Reconciliation in Ontario and Canada is dead. So I ask again, yes or no, is Ontario ready for real reconciliation by sharing the lands, the resources, the power with the Indigenous peoples? Minister to reply. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the answer to that question is yes, and it's on full display, Mr. Speaker. And I would urge the member to reach out and talk to a number of groups, including Supercom, Mr. Speaker, an organization in northwestern Ontario who will be employing a couple of hundred people to, we to work on the east-west tie. I would encourage the member to speak to a couple of communities in his own riding who uh, are on the precipice, Mr. Speaker, of moving forward with significant uh, developments in the ring of fire. I would encourage the member opposite, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that he's listening to his constituents who are asking for full participation and Order. getting it from every ministry in this government, including the Ministry of Natural Resources, who's working with the leadership of Anishinaabe Aski Nation, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that moving forward, the for forward, the Far North Act is not going to be a piece of legislation that was previously shoved down the throats of those isolated and remote communities, but will reflect, Mr. Speaker, the best intentions of this Spons. government and those communities to ensure that development in the North, Mr. Speaker, Speaker, is guided by and in part of the decision coming from Indigenous communities in the far north. Imagine that, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to welcome everyone back. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Public health experts tell us that onerous sick leave policies increase the risk of spreading illness. The province's own public health web page about the flu explicitly tells people to stay home if they feel ill. And yet the government completely ignored best practices when it canceled paid sick leave days and gave employers the power to make sick notes mandatory. The rollback of basic workplace protections increased the risk of spreading illnesses to others at a time when we are experiencing a hallway medicine crisis and overcrowding in our hospitals. Speaker, I asked the Deputy Premier, why did the government go against the advice of public health experts by repealing workplace protections that prevent the spread of illness? The question is to the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. Of course, in every situation where people are feeling unwell, they should be staying home, especially at a time where we have increased concerns and fears with respect to the coronavirus. We want people to make sure that they self-isolate if they're not feeling well. That is really important. And thus far, we have been seeing that happening in the province of Ontario. People are being responsible. They are taking the necessary measures that they need in order to get well themselves, but also to prevent the spread and transmission of whatever illness it is that they have. With respect to the sick leave note issue, that is something that is not mandatory. That is something that employers can choose to bring forward. Many are not doing that, so we anticipate that any issues with respect to that will be mitigated, particularly under the circumstances that we're dealing with with the coronavirus by the Response. employers of Ontario. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, I asked the Deputy Premier whether she's listening to health care workers. 175 health care workers recently signed an open letter to the Premier in which they stated, and I quote, in the context of recent concerns with the novel coronavirus in Ontario, we consider the current provincial labour laws to be a serious threat 
to the health and safety of Ontarians. Evidence backs this up, Speaker. A poll conducted by Ipsos for the Canadian Medical Association found that 8 in 10 Ontarians said they would likely come into work when ill if their employer required a sick note. The medical professionals are clear. People should stay home when they are sick. So, Speaker, I ask the Deputy Premier, will you listen to health care experts and bring back paid sick leave days and put an end to sick, no sick uh, notes from Thank employers? You. Minister to reply. Well, thank you. Well, first, I would reiterate the fact that the sick notes are not mandatory. That is something that can be brought forward by employers. Employers are showing uh, great uh, cooperation and collaboration as we're dealing with the novel coronavirus. We don't want it to spread anymore. So we have been very fortunate so far that we have had only three confirmed cases in Ontario. We hope that continues, but that's difficult to say. What I can tell you is the system is working. We are taking the necessary precautions. We are listening to people on the front lines, and we are listening to our public health units. Do we agree with the, all of the comments that were made in that letter? Some of which we do agree with, some of which we don't agree with, because we know that we are taking the necessary precautions, both for the safety of the people who may be affected by the coronavirus, but also for our frontline health care workers. We want them to be safe and be able to do their jobs. What? That is what we're focusing on, and we will continue to focus on that as we deal with this situation. So thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Infrastructure. I know that our government understands the importance of investing in community infrastructure uh, to help rural communities such as Niagara West get ahead. It's one of the best ways that we can drive rural economic development. With more than 420 small rural and northern communities across Ontario facing unique challenges in their local infrastructure systems, uh, I want to hear more about what the minister has been doing to invest across Ontario. Mr. Speaker, Ontario's economy is thriving. We've created more than 300,000 new jobs in the province. And with this new era of economic prosperity, we must ensure that every person in every region across the province shares in the opportunity. Could the minister tell the House a little bit more about how our government is supporting small, rural and northern communities through investments, significant investments, I might add, to build, maintain and repair local roads, bridges, water and wastewater systems? Questions to the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Niagara West for his question. As Minister of Infrastructure, I've heard from many municipalities that they need sustainable funding to support the building of roads, bridges in their communities. That is why last fall, our government confirmed about $200 million in total formula-based funding for 2020 through the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund. This funding allows communities to move forward with critical infrastructure projects while providing flexibility to address their local needs. Mr. Speaker, I am proud to tell this House that we fulfilled our commitment to predictable and stable infrastructure funding for small and rural and northern municipalities. And just last month, Premier Ford and I joined the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka, and announced the OSIF 2020 allocation for all 424 eligible communities. With this funding, we are working Pons. directly with our municipal partners to help them build much needed community infrastructure that will build healthier and more vibrant and safer communities. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her response. Speaker, I was pleased to see that across Niagara we received more than $9.6 million in this incredible funding, and also $2.5 million came through this formula to the five municipalities in my riding. Among the communities in Niagara West receiving funding, the town of Grimsby received more than $1.1 million, the town of Lincoln received more than $616,000, the town of Pelham more than $480,000, and West Lincoln and Waynefleet combined received more than $322,000. Hmm. I know that this injection of funding for the municipalities in my riding provides a great opportunity to build, renew and expand the crumbling infrastructure in rural Ontario after 15 years of Liberal neglect. Could the minister please explain why this funding is so important for riding such as Niagara West and how this investment will improve the current condition of community infrastructure across Ontario? Minister of Infrastructure. Well, 
Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm glad the member asked this important question. And I can say with certainty that our government understands that predictability and stability in community infrastructure funding goes a long way for small, rural, and northern communities. We have heard this sentiment time and time again when talking to our municipal partners. Mr. Speaker, you know that the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund was specifically designed to support the local priorities of small, rural and northern communities who face unique challenges in getting infrastructure built. The Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund is an excellent example of how formula-based funding helps our small, rural and northern communities prioritize their infrastructures, including the roads and bridges and critical water and wastewater and stormwater systems. By providing municipalities their allocation in a timely manner, we help support the long-term planning and budgeting for our municipal partners. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this year at Roma, uh, we received overwhelming support in engaging with our municipalities and helping them uh, with their local priorities in a timely, fashionable way. And we'll Thank you very much. <laughs> now going to revert to the Leader's questions from the official opposition. I recognize the leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My, uh, my question is to the Premier. Parents and students are looking at another week of chaos and cuts in the classroom, and instead of listening, the Premier keeps ignoring the overwhelming evidence that his cuts are in fact real and that they're hurting our kids. The Premier said yesterday that funding has increased for schools in response to one of my questions. So can he explain why the chair of the Halton District School Board said just yesterday that their board gained 1,000 students, new students, and funding went down by $1.5 million? <laughs> the Premier. Well, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Leader of the Opposition for, for the question. My friends, these strikes are impacting families. They're impacting the economy right, right across uh, Ontario. When people can't go to, to work, it costs them money. And that's not fair to the families, and it's not fair to the kids. We want a deal that keeps the kids in the classroom. I keep repeating that. We want a deal to make sure the kids are in the classroom day in and day out. We'll continue to invest more in the priorities of parents, uh, what parents want to see, Mr. Speaker, that I talk to, they want math, they want STEM, and they want mental health. Yeah. Students deserve to be in the classroom, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to negotiate in good faith with the union leaders and at the end Response. of this disruption and keep our kids in the classroom, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, what parents want is an end to the cuts. They want an end to the cuts. They don't want to see classroom sizes balloon. They don't want to see mandatory online learning. They don't want to see supports for kids at high risk to be removed. They want to see the quality of education in this province protected. But, but look, yesterday, the Premier also claimed yet again that not a single teacher has lost their job as a result of his cuts. Does the Premier recognize the name of Jonathan Lefren? Questions addressed to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, we have increased education by $1.2 billion. Here, here. I know math is not the NDP's strength for the Liberals, but it's $1.2 billion more than any government in the history of Ontario. We're maintaining the smallest classroom sizes in the entire country. In the entire country, we're going to maintain the smallest classroom sizes. We invest more in student success in math and special education than anyone else in the country. We listen to the parents and the students, and we've been reasonable at the bargaining table, Mr. Speaker. We reduced the classroom size from 28 to 25. We reduced mandatory online learning from four to two. Mr. Speaker, online learning gets kids ready Response. for the next generation. The next generation, when they go into the work world, when they go into college and universities, they're going to be studying online. And be very frank, I think everyone that have kids that are in university. Thank you. Thank you. Order. Order. The next final supplementary. 
Well, Speaker, um, just to remind the Premier, Mr. Lefren is one of many teachers who lost a full-time permanent job just last year. In fact, I'm going to send across a photo uh, via the, the page uh, to uh, show him uh, a person who's literally standing in front of the Premier's constituency office with a sign you know, a sandwich board sign that says, if not one single teacher will lose their job, then why am I here and not at school? Does the Premier have an answer for Mr. Lefren, Speaker, or is he ready to Order. admit that he actually might have his facts wrong? Premier? Well, the lead leader of the opposition, Mr. Speaker, know that in this chamber, we don't hire the students. We give the funding. So the funding increased $1.2 billion until no teacher Order. would lose their job, Mr. Speaker. But the leader of the opposition knows the boards are the ones that hire the, the teachers, not, not us. Absolutely. Absolutely. But Mr. Speaker, we are investing $3.1 billion in special education funding, Order. the highest levels this province has ever seen. Yep. Be proud of that. We've, we've announced a four-year, $200 million math strategy until our grade six students don't have the lowest scores in the country. We'll make sure they have the highest scores in the country, Mr. Speaker. We're creating a new math curriculum for grades one to eight, which will be ready for next year. Again, Response. helping our students lead the country when it comes to math. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. My next question is also uh, to the Premier, but maybe a little bit of learning for the Premier. When you, when you cut cool school funding, when schools don't have the money, or when you increase Order. class sizes, guess what happens? Teachers Order. get fired. That's what happens, and that's what's happening right now here in the province of Ontario. But look, the Premier and his education minister also insist that Alabama-style mandatory online learning Order. is backed by parents, teachers and students. So can the Premier tell us exactly how many parents survive, surveyed by the Toronto District School Board actually agree with him in this assertion? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Let me just correct the member for the Leader of the Opposition. Halton District School Board funding actually went up $2.1 million. And I like to hope. I like to hope that when she asks a question, she wouldn't want to mislead this House, Speaker. Yeah. Because the fact yeah. is. And ask the Minister of Education to withdraw the yeah. oh. and conclude his response. The point, Speaker, is investment is up in Halton. It is up in Hamilton, and it is up across this province, and we're doing that because we believe in public education. What we also expect is accountability for the taxpayer and the parent of this province. We want more for our kids. We are not the party of complacency and the status quo. We believe in embracing the market. We know where the puck is going when it comes to jobs. We're going to embrace it, but most importantly, we're going to ensure we get a deal that keeps our kids in class. A supplementary question. Well, Speaker, I guess the Minister of Education is not doing his homework, but I'm going to send him a tweet that was posted just the other day from, Order. from, Order. from the board. Stop the clock. The government side will come to order. Restart the clock. Leader of the Opposition. From the board that says very clearly the board gained 1,000 students and funding went down by 1.5 million. So we all know that, Mr., um, uh, that the Minister of Education and the, Minister and the uh, Premier like to uh, spin a lot, but the facts are the facts, and you can have a look at what the facts are. Order. But just so that the Premier is clear, 87% of students disagree with the government's e learning initiative, 81% of parents disagree with those initiatives, and 97% of secondary school teachers disagree with him as well. Sorry, Speaker, that was supposed to go to the Minister of Education. Uh, I'm sure you'll find it interesting, though. Uh, but look, it's not just Toronto. The chair of the York Region School Board wrote to the Education Minister just last week begging Question. the government to pause this scheme of e-learning. Is the Premier ready to admit that he may just have his facts wrong yet again? Minister of Education. 
Mr. Speaker, 100 per cent of parents want a deal that keeps their kids in class, and every member of this caucus agrees. That's why in this negotiation we are fighting, Speaker. We are fighting in this negotiation to ensure that while we invest more, we expect more, we get more for taxpayers and students who deserve more. And Mr. Speaker, I can't conceive why there are forces in this legislature who would not want to help nurture greater talent when it comes to technology and the fluency required in the marketplace. But, Speaker, when it comes to what we're trying to do at the negotiating table, provide a deal that keeps kids in class, provide an incentive to improve the quality of our educators, ensuring that the hiring of teaching is premised, Mr. Speaker, in this province on qualification, on merit and on equity, not on who's been in the line the longest. Mr. Speaker, it's about ensuring that when we see a nearly 80 per cent of the dollar on compensation, that we get greater value. When 50 per cent of our students are not meeting the Response. provincial math standard, we know in this party that we can do more, we can do better, and our kids deserve it. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, my final supplementary is back to the Premier. The Premier needs to stop defending these cuts and start thinking about Ontario's kids. The Premier is wrong on mandatory e-learning, he's wrong on the classroom cuts, and he's wrong on the teacher layoffs. It's very, very obvious. What parents, students, teachers and education workers need is something better, something better than what this minister keeps uh, you know, uh, repeating over and over again. So what we need is a, a commitment from this Premier. Will he find Finally, admit that we do need a new approach. Stop trying to defend these indefensible cuts and changes and bring in a new minister with a new mandate to actually get a deal that doesn't hurt our students and doesn't erode the quality of education in the province of Ontario. Minister. Mr. Speaker, what is categorically indefensible is the maintenance of a hiring practice that provides seniority in a union over qualifications. That is unacceptable to the people of this province. And do not take it from me, Speaker. Let us heed the advice of Nancy Brady, the president of the Ontario Principals Council, who said new teacher college graduates cannot be considered for permanent teaching positions when they are the best candidate to meet schools' needs. We support transparent and flexible hiring practices for teaching positions. However, seniority should not be the deciding factor. We agree, Mr. Speaker. The next question. The member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. As the NDP critic for transportation and highways, I asked this government yesterday to address the safety issue of the shiny new blue problematic license plates. And, Speaker, Ontarians have seen this government purposefully try to distract from issues like education, clean drinking water, health care, and housing. But this issue of highly reflective, sometimes invisible license plates doesn't seem to be a story that they created on purpose. I don't know what the process was, but it would seem these license plates were rolled out before they had been road tested. Now we are hearing from an operations expert in Toronto that Toronto Photo Radar is having trouble picking up the small lettering on the plates. It can't read the words on it cannot read the word Ontario. <laughs> Yesterday the Minister of Government and Consumer Services bragged about these plates, claimed that this government had been exhaustive with their testing. So speaker, my question is, what does exhaustive testing mean to this government? The Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I want to ensure that I know everyone in this House will agree the previous license plate had significant durability issues that resulted in peeling and flaking. Everyone has to agree with that. So to address this issue, Opposition our government order. rolled out a redesigned plate that uses high-definition material that is much stronger. The new Ontario license plates were designed in partnership with 3M. They're responsible for quality control and manufacturing the plates. We have been made aware of the concerns. We are listening and we're continuing to work with the manufacturer, stakeholders and the public through this process. You know, 3M has used high definition laminate in plates and 3M also uses plates in other North American jurisdictions, including Nova Quebec with regards to special veterans plates, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and 13 other jurisdictions. Again, I want to be perfectly clear. We have heard the concern. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Safety has to come first on our roadways. Sergeant Koopman from Kingston Police posted 
plate photos and said, quote, they're virtually unreadable at night. Joe Kuto of the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police said, quote, it shows very clearly that, especially at night, there may be some visibility issues. Brian Patterson of the Ontario Safety League worries, quote, you have to be fairly close to read them with precision. If you're calling in an impaired driver, you want to make sure you give the license plate correctly, end quote. Safety experts are sounding the alarm while this minister is desperately telling people these plates are great and people like them, and she maintains that there's nothing to see here, folks. Well, she's partially right, Speaker. At night, there isn't anything to see. So how, Minister, are you going to fix these plates and keep us safe? <laughs> Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Again, I would like to share with the House that we have heard the concerns. We are listening, and we're continuing to work with the manufacturer, our stakeholders, and the public to get this right. Thank you very much. The next question, order. 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 Next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, my question is to the Premier, but it might be a good time to remind everybody that it's Kindness Week in Ontario. Just saying, folks. Speaker, there are many families in my riding of Ottawa South living with a child, an adult child with a developmental disability, as I am sure there are in the Premier's writing. Their lives are a daily struggle just to get what their, children's need, their children need and to survive as a family. Like I said, their lives are a daily struggle. Their needs are simple, a program for their son or daughter, maybe some respite, and a safe place when they can't, for their child when they can't take care of their child anymore. So the 2019 budget showed a cut of $1 billion from the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services. Last year, we learned that the government was going to pay a consultant up to $1 million to find savings in the developmental services sector. And I'm hoping that the Premier or the Minister can share that with this House. Question. Speaker, through you, can the Premier commit today to not cutting funds for families with children with developmental disabilities? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services to respond. Well, thanks very much uh, for the question this morning from the member opposite. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned yesterday in a question from the official opposition on this topic, we know that the demand is growing for developmental services in Ontario, and that includes uh, supportive housing as well, Mr. Speaker. And that's why our government, over the last uh, number of months, and we will continue over the coming one, uh, months, to consult with our partners in that sector so we can do something that the previous <laughs> government didn't do. And that was to help solve the waiting list when it comes to uh, the need for this type of housing, Mr. Speaker, and these type of supports for individuals uh, with developmental disabilities. We know that individuals with developmental disabilities are uh, turning 18 every day and becoming adults, and we know that uh, those individuals are living longer, Mr. Speaker, and that's putting an added strain uh, on those wait lists for supportive housing. That's why uh, we brought in a consultant to help us look at jurisdictions Response. that are leading the way in this area so that we can start to tackle the problem that the previous government didn't, and that's build housing for these individuals and help get them the supports that they need. The supplementary question. I thank the minister for his answer, but what I was really looking for was a simple yes or no. Are you going to cut it or not? And I didn't get that answer, so perhaps the minister, through you, Speaker, can give that answer. There are investments. There are investments that were made, were made in the 2018 budget that were not followed through by this government. Were not followed through in passport, in money to agencies, and the minister knows that, Speaker. So I'm going to ask again, very simply, yes or no? Are you going to cut from developmental services inside your ministry? Yes or no? Thank you, Speaker. Minister. Speaker, I can tell you that uh, what's been clear in the conversations that I've had with our partners in this sector is that many of these families that they serve are facing the same challenges that they were facing 15 years ago, Mr. Speaker, because the government that was in charge of this file did absolutely nothing to get them the supports that they need. You know, it's hard to imagine, Mr. Speaker, that a government could run up a $15 billion deficit 
That means they're spending a lot more money than they're bringing in, Mr. Speaker, but they're not helping these vulnerable individuals in our community. What do we have to show? for a multi-billion dollar deficit year after year after year from the previous Liberal government, and no action on this file. That's why we're committed to this file, Mr. Speaker, to work with our partners, to look at leading jurisdictions in this area, to get these individuals the supports that they need, that they haven't. Thank you. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. The member from Mississauga Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Good morning. My question is to the Premier. Premier, our government was elected to address gridlock and congestion that has made life harder for my constituents in Mississauga and other residents across the GTHA. The quality of life of my constituents continue to suffer as they lose precious hours of their days waiting for overcrowded transit or on roads with way too many cars. Their time could be better spent with their families and their loved ones or contributing to our economy instead of being stuck in gridlock. In 2019, Metrolinx saw an increase in ridership of 5.5 per cent, up to 77 million riders. This represents a 50 per cent overall increase for ridership in the past decade. Premier, can you share with this House what our government is doing to address congestion, build transit faster, and get Ontario moving? Through, through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I, I want to thank our all-star uh, member from Mississauga Centre and all the members from Mississauga. We're doing a great job out there. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our government is a government that are getting people moving once and for all after years and years of delays and procrastination, uh, not only through the, the city but through the province. We're finally building new tracks. We're increasing subway lines by 50 per cent. Almost, almost doubling that, Mr. Speaker. Due comparison, the Spadina line and the Eglinton line took 10 to 11 years, and they're still working on it. Overruns of over a billion dollars under under the Liberal government. We're going to be doing the exact same, but putting double the amount of tracks in the same time frame. But the only difference is we're going to be on time and we're going to be on budget, Mr. Speaker. Here, here moving millions and millions of more passengers, getting people Response. out of their cars to make sure they get from point A to point B in the most rapid fashion we can. Thank you. Thank you, Premier. That is indeed great news and speaks to why action is needed right away. Imagine how much better life would be uh, for residents in Toronto, in Mississauga, and across the GTHA had previous governments accelerated transit investments. For decades, Toronto councillors opposed long-term transit plans and building of relief lines, stating it doesn't make sense because the trains would be packed from day one. In response to those concerns, Liberal Premier David Peterson decided not to move ahead with that plan. Premier, can you share with this House how our government our government's proposed legislation will help transit development. Here. Again, I want, to, I want to thank the, the member from Mississauga Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I want to acknowledge the great work from our minister and our associate minister, and what a great announcement yesterday, so congratulations. <laughs> We're seeing more done, Mr. Speaker, in the last year and a half than we saw 15 years under the Liberals and the NDP. Again, we're getting the people going, moving. Congestion, Mr. Speaker, costs GTA alone $11 billion. That's $11 billion, Mr. Speaker. Congestion also adds about $400 million in additional cost of goods while having them stand in traffic. You see those trucks just lined up? Well, Mr. Speaker, we're putting an end to that. We have a great transportation, transportation plan through the leadership of our Minister of Transportation and Associate Minister. Response. We're going to continue moving forward, Mr. Speaker, and get the city and GTA moving once and for all. Here, here. Thank you. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last year, the Premier halted work on the relief line, a project that was supposed to begin construction this year. Instead, the Premier announced a new idea, the Ontario Line, ripping up years of planning work and replacing them with lines and dots on a map. 
The Toronto Star recently reported that the Ontario Line concept was first pitched only a few months earlier by a private consultant who had previously condemned the very idea of a relief line subway. How can the Premier claim he is speeding up transit when he is willing to rip up established plans and start all over again based on the whims of private consultants? Recognize the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have reached a pivotal moment in Mr. Speaker, we have reached a pivotal moment in history where all three levels of government agree on our subway plan, a single unified subway plan for the city of Toronto, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, Toronto City Council did not just endorse our subway plan with an overwhelming majority, but they also directed the city manager to work with us, and I quote, to identify all opportunities to accelerate the delivery of our expansion projects. Mr. Speaker, we've introduced legislation to that end. We agree. With the, with the member opposite, who said yesterday that we have a congestion crisis in the GTA. Yep. Mr. Speaker, she said we have an overcrowding of public, on public transit problem. Mr. Speaker, she admitted that there is an economic cost to this problem, Mr. Wow. Speaker. What she, doesn't, uh, what she does not have is a plan to actually Fair. reduce congestion nope. and get people moving in Thank the city you. of Toronto. Thank you. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Um, so my question is back to the Premier. Uh, the Premier wants to give himself the power to start con transit construction work before an environmental assessment is even finished. He also wants the power to shut down streets and bridges without the consent of the City of Toronto. Businesses and residents along Eglinton Avenue are hurting because of disruption and delays by the P3 contractor. And now we hear that the project is delayed yet another year, even though Metrolinx paid the P3 contractor an extra $237 million to keep this project on schedule. Why does the Premier want to give P3 contractors the power to impose even more construction disruption on local communities? Minister of Transportation, once again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, obviously, we heard yesterday from Metrolinx that the Eglinton Crosstown project will be delayed, and this is devastating to residents and to businesses along Eglinton. And our government shares the frustration of those residents and those businesses, which is why Associate Minister of Transportation Surma and I directed Metrolinx this morning to work closely with the city and to work closely with Metrolink, to, to work closely with the city and to find ways to accelerate the delivery of the Eglinton Crosstown, Mr. Speaker. Our government is committed to doing diff things differently. And Mr. Speaker, unlike the opposition, we have a plan. It's called the Building Transit Faster Act, Mr. Speaker. And if the member opposite is so concerned about getting people off the streets and getting people onto Order. subways, then she will support the Building yeah. Transit Faster Act. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Yesterday, the Minister introduced an important piece of legislation that is central to our goal of building better, faster public transit for the GTA. These measures, if passed, will streamline the processes uh, we have in place to expedite the delivery of our four priority projects, the Young North Extension, the three-stop Scarborough Extension, the Eglinton West Extension, and the Ontario Line. Can the minister tell us how build the Building Transit Faster Act will allow us to meet these ambitious timelines? Eglinton Lawrence for the question. Yesterday, the member for University Rosedale spoke at length about the congestion crisis in the city of Toronto, and that is something that we can agree on, Speaker. The Building Transit Faster Act, if passed, will cut through the red tape and the redundant steps that hold up major transit projects. We simply cannot afford any more delays, Mr. Speaker. Our plan is responsible and it is reasonable. Our government's proposals are about streamlining processes, not about changing outcomes. We need more transit to cope with today's gridlock and with tomorrow's growth. The Building Transit Faster Act, if passed, would be a means to that end. The supplementary question. 
Thank you to the minister for that answer. I feel the urgency to get subways built in my riding of Eglinton Lawrence. My constituents will directly benefit from the Ontario line, and they are eager to see the shovels in the ground. Streamlining processes where we can, without compromising on outcomes, just makes sense. The Building Transit Faster Act outlines the tools we need to build transit responsibly and efficiently. Yep. Speaker, could the minister please advise the House about how crucial this legislation is? The Minister of Transportation. Thank you again to the member for the question. We have a historic subway plan that finally all three levels of government agree on. Our government has the political will, Mr. Speaker, to build on the progress that we've made with our municipal and with our federal partners to build a world-class transportation network that the GTA so desperately needs. This bill will keep us on track to unlocking gridlock. It will ensure that Ontario is best positioned to attract new business, and it will pave a new and brighter future for generations to come. Our plan is the right plan, Mr. Speaker, and I invite all the members opposite to get on board and support this legislation. The next question, the member for Toronto, St. Paul's. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. It's not just commuters who are hurting thanks to Liberal and Conservative transportation failures. Businesses in my riding of St. Paul's are paying the brunt of continued delays in delivering the Eglinton Crosstown. Another year of delays means that businesses that were already barely hanging on, Mr. Speaker, are being faced with deeper debt and distress. Mr. Speaker, my constituents know how important it is to expand transport transit, but everyday families and business owners shouldn't have to pay the price for government incompetence. My question to the Premier. Oh, <laughs> businesses, business owners are getting desperate. They've been asking for help for years now. Will the government finally commit to ensuring that businesses and families have the support they need to survive another necessary de delay? Mr. Premier. I recognize the Minister of Transportation to respond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Eglinton Crosstown is a prime example of, of an important project that's faced years of delay due to time spent obtaining permits, licenses, and approvals. Unfortunately, Metrolinx indicated that the Eglinton Crosstown is that for the opening of Eglinton Crosstown can no longer be possible in the fall of 2021, that that is no longer achievable. But, Mr. Speaker, our government is proposing a new way forward. The Building Transit Faster Act, Mr. Speaker, will find a way to get rid of the political gridlock that has caused delays that has impacted residents and businesses in the member opposite's riding and in other ridings across, across this city in such a negative way. We don't believe that's right, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we have a plan to resolve this issue. But I hope the member opposite will do what's right for the members of the people in her riding and vote for the Building Transit Faster Act. Thank you. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, newsflash, Minister of Transportation, the plan's not working in St. Paul's. Anyways, half measures and the same tired old talking points Order. aren't going to help the businesses in my riding. Order. We need action, and we needed it years ago. Business owners are having to go to the food bank, Mr. Speaker, to make ends meet. People are behind on their rent, and all they get from the government is silence and indifference silence and indifference. They're not getting business compensation. They're not getting money to pay for their rent. Again, to the Premier, this government pretends that Ontario opened for business, but Order. thanks to, uh, to continued Conservative and Liberal transportation failures along the Eglinton line, the only thing we're seeing in St. Paul's question. are closed signs. My question is simple. Why don't businesses in St. Paul's, such as Young and Eglinton, Dufferin and Eglinton, Little Jamaica, why don't they matter as much as the businesses owned by Thank you very much. Thank you. Line? Minister of Transportation, we're back. Order. 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 I recognize the Minister of Transportation to reply. 
What the residents Raider of the Jones, riding of St. Paul's have, Mr. Speaker, wow. is a representative who is on the wrong side of this issue. Our government has a plan, Mr. Speaker. We've Opposition introduced come legislation. To order. We've introduced a transit Opposition plan. come to order. We have directed met Member for and Toronto, St. Paul's, come to order. Links, Mr. Speaker. Hamilton West, and Caster Dundas, come to order. And support businesses. We have directed Metro to find ways order. to accelerate the delivery. I apologize to the Minister of Transportation. The official opposition members who are shouting across the floor will come to order. Stop the clock. Okay. I'm going to say something. There were gestures on the part of both members who participated in this exchange. They don't enhance decorum when we're pointing at each other. It happened on both sides. It happened on both sides. Restart the clock. The Minister of Transportation can conclude her response. Mr. Speaker, our government has a plan to alleviate congestion in the GTA. We've introduced our ambitious plan. Yesterday, I introduced legislation that will find a way to, deliver, to accelerate Spons. the delivery of that plan. Mr. Speaker, we're working with Metrolink so that we can address the Eglinton Crosstown issue. Mr. Speaker, we have a plan. What does the NDP have, Mr. Not Speaker? I admit it's Thank you very much. The next question, member for Niagara West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Infrastructure. Uh, Speaker, last year I had the pleasure of being joined by Premier Ford to announce important infrastructure investments to improve the condition of local roads in my riding of Niagara West. We visited uh, the town of Pelham, where we announced $1.6 million to reconstruct Pelham Street, including new sidewalks, cycling lanes, and street lighting. I know that this investment will have a significant impact on the economic development in the town of Pelham and, and will enhance the safety and reliability of this roadway. I'm proud that our government is working with our municipal, part municipal partners to get projects like this built. And I know my local mayors are very happy to see the Premier in Niagara West. Speaker, through you to the Minister, could the Minister tell this House uh, a little bit more about Ontarians living in the Niagara region and if they can look forward to more road and transit infrastructure investments in the future? Questions addressed to the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member uh, from Niagara West for his question. As I've already indicated uh, to the House, Ontario has nominated over 140 road, bridge, air, and marine infrastructure projects for a total provincial investment of more than $115 million through the rural and northern stream of the ICIP Bilateral Investor Infrastructure Investment Agreement. If all the rural and northern projects nominated to date are approved by the federal government, the total investment by all levels of government could reach up to $592 million for Ontario communities. Our government is and will continue to work with our municipal partners, families and businesses to make smart investments in our infrastructure and keep it reliable for the people of Ontario. We are also investing in hundreds of transit infrastructure projects Response. in more than 50 communities located outside the GTHA, including transit projects that will serve municipalities in the Niagara region and the city of Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to giving more information in the supplemental. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Speaker, and as always, it's a privilege to hear uh, about the investments that the minister and our government are making in infrastructure across Ontario. I know the minister also mentioned transit infrastructure, which is something that's very important in the Niagara region as we move towards uh, our first uh, regional transit system. I know that some of the investments the minister has announced over the uh, past year include funding for the purchase of two conventional expansion buses that will enhance regional transit service. And I know that other investments in the region include technology upgrades that improve operations and safety and a fare box system that will also help integrate transit in the the Niagara region. Transit riders in the city of St. Catharines will benefit from the purchase of 10 new buses and four specialized transit vehicles that will improve accessibility and reliability while reducing maintenance costs. So, Could the minister speak a little bit more about what other investments our government continues to make to transit infrastructure in the Niagara region? Minister. Mr. Speaker, and again, I'd like to thank the member for his question. 
And the member is correct. Once approved by the federal government, our government is investing almost $23.9 million in the region of Niagara for transit infrastructure projects. In Welland, Ontario is investing $5 million for the construction of an operations facility to store 40 conventional and specialized buses and will allow for bus maintenance and training space. In neighbouring St. Catharines, the province is investing over $3.3 million for the expansion of a maintenance and bus storage facility to accommodate increased demands. Niagara Falls will also see an investment of $1.5 million for the construction of a multimodal hub, which will support interconnectivity of transit, pedestrian and parking, with connections to the future GO terminal in Niagara Falls. Response. Mr. Speaker, I remain optimistic that the federal minister will approve these projects as soon as possible so that we can get the shovels in the ground to build these projects. Thank you. The next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Visiting us today are youth who are seeking mental health services, and I want to tell you one story. Victoria was in high school when she started struggling with severe anxiety and signs of mental illness. When she sought help at the hospital, treatment wasn't available, and she was put on a wait list. While on the wait list, she had to access the emergency room several times. Each time, she was sent home and told to wait. Her mom had to quit her job to stay home and care for her. She waited eight months before being able to access the intense treatments and the inpatient care she needed. In the middle of her treatment, she turned 18 and was discharged from the hospital involuntarily due to aging out of the system. Speaker, Victoria is not alone. 28,000 children and youth in this province are currently waiting for mental health and addictions care, doubling the already long wait list for services left by the Liberals. Can the Premier please explain to Question. Victoria why this government cut $69 million from children's mental health funding? Yeah. The Minister to reply. <laughs> Minister of Health. And first, let me say I'm sorry that Victoria had this experience, but it is something that, frankly, we inherited from the previous government that didn't do anything to deal with this. We have made mental health and addictions a priority, as you know. We have committed to spending $3.8 billion over the next 10 years, money equally matched by the province and the federal government. We have already spent $174 million this year than what was spent the previous year. We are making connections for young people, for children and youth and young adults. We, uh, we know that simply spending the money, though, isn't the simple answer to it. There's much more that we need to do. With the consent of this entire House, for which I'm grateful, we were able to pass the legislation that allowed for the Center of a Mental Health Addiction Center of Excellence. This is going to build the data. It's going to introduce best practices, Spons. and it's going to make sure that there's a core basket of services in every part of Ontario. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. I beg to inform the House that, pursuant to Standing Order 101C, a change has been made to the order of precedence on the ballot list for private members' public business, such that on the ballot list draw of November 4, 2019, Mr. Miller, Hamilton East Stony Creek, assumes ballot item number seven, and Ms. Fife assumes ballot item number nine. The member for Peterborough Gwartha has informed me he has a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to invite all the MPPs to room 248 as soon as we leave question period for a meet and greet reception with the Challenger baseball team. Thank you very much. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m.